A very good afternoon to everyone here in India and good morning to those of you who are joining us from Europe. Uh, welcome to our second Horizon Europe a brokerage event in India on the co-funding opportunities between the EU and India under the Horizon Europe Research Innovation Framework Program. Today's topic will be a responsible artificial intelligence. It's a very exciting call and we are very much looking forward to presenting you the modalities of this call and also to look into the presentations of uh, our scientists, both from Europe and India, who are looking for partners to apply to this call. Now, it gives me an immense pleasure uh, to welcome um, our uh, speaker, our first speaker of today, Dr. Benoit. Roche. He's the first counselor, digital transformation, migration and mobility, health and food safety at the EU delegation to India. A very warm welcome to you, Benoit, uh, joining us from Delhi. And uh, very happy that you will give the opening remarks of today's event. Thank you. Thank you very much, Samrat. And uh, esteemed colleagues in Europe and in India, distinguished researchers and innovators. Ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm really happy uh, to deliver these opening remarks today as I am in charge here in Delhi of fostering the dialogue of digital transformation between India and the European Union. And uh, this event aiming at creating opportunities for collaboration between EU and India research and innovation sphere in the area of responsible artificial intelligence is very close to my heart. In general terms, uh, the European Union and India are strategic partners. We are partners in prosperity, in responsible development, and also in global peace and security. This strategic partnership is based on shared values and a common vision of priorities for our societies. And these priorities include elements such as democracy, respect of the rule of law or human rights. On the digital sector in particular, our cooperation with India is really flourishing immensely lately. And I would like to illustrate that to take three examples. The first one is the, the, the EU-India Connectivity Partnership that was announced in 2021. Two of its pillars are very relevant to uh, our day. The first one is the uh, digital connectivity pillar, but the other one also very important is the people-to-people -people connectivity. And what we are doing here today, bringing researchers uh, from the both blocks uh, to, uh, to connect and interact is very relevant under this connectivity partnership. The second example that I would like to, to take to illustrate uh, this flourishing cooperation is very recent. Two days ago, EU and India released a joint statement announcing this Trade and Technology Council, creating a high-level coordination platform on the intersecting aspects of trade, technology, and security. That will provide a political steer needed for in-depth strategic and, and engagement. Within this Trade and Technology Council, a working group on strategic technologies, digital governance, and digital connectivity will be covering issues, including artificial intelligence. The third example that I, I wanted to share with you is uh, this creation of the EU-India Task Force on Artificial Intelligence. And again, this is stemming from a high-level political engagement. It has been set up under a joint chairmanship of Niti Ayog and the European Commission, DG Connect, the Directorate General for uh, Connect Issues, and it bears the objective to implement a shared vision of responsible, trustworthy, and human-centric artificial intelligence. And one of the remit of the task force is to facilitate networking between researchers and experts from the EU and India working on topics of mutual interest. So you can imagine that this 
Horizon Europe program calling for proposal on efficient, trustworthy AI, making the best of data perfectly complement the ongoing efforts. My colleagues from the European delegation, from, from the delegation of the European uh, Commission, in particular DigiConnect, will be here explaining more about the call during the course of this event. Uh, before closing down, I would like to uh, convey my sincere appreciation to the Department of Science and Technology for collaborating with the EU on the Horizon Europe program and of course for selecting this seminal topic. I understand that DST has selected further call, uh, including, including artificial intelligence topic, in particular, so this explainable and robust AI that will be open later in, in the year. And therefore, I'm confident that it's only the beginning of a mutual beneficial collaboration between our two blocks, creating links to our research and innovation spheres that will outlast this particular program. I wish you fruitful, fruitful discussion and we are looking forward to many successful collaboration through concrete joint call on research and innovation project. Colleagues, um, I wish you very productive discussions. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Benoit, for uh, this very inspiring uh, opening remarks. Also highlighting the importance of this uh, topic, both for the European side and for India in their strategic partnership, but also the political importance of, of, of it. Um, we were expecting Dr. Arvind from the DST, as uh, Benoit already mentioned. Uh, this has been the main collaborator on, on, on this joint call, uh, so co-funded call, sorry. Uh, Dr. Arvind is traveling and unfortunately not available, but he sends his best regards and wishes uh, to all the participants today. So with that, uh, I thank again uh, uh, Benoit for joining us. And uh, if you have the possibility, please stay on. But of course, if you have, uh, we know you have a busy schedule. So uh, yeah, we thank you for now. And uh, we move on to uh, the next part of today's session, which uh, will be led by Dr. Vivek Dham, who is the advisor at the research innovation section at the EU delegation to India. Um, hi Vivek, uh, good to have you. And um, Vivek will now uh, give us the guidelines uh, for participation, the technical aspects of this call, uh, which, as said, is co-funded by uh, the uh, EU and the DSD. Vivek, the floor is yours. Before I uh, let Vivek uh, take over the mic, I also uh, request all our participants to use the Q&A uh, function to send us your questions uh, to the speakers, uh, especially now to Vivek and then the following presenters. We will try to answer them uh, as time permits. Uh, if you are interested to reach out to potential partners, we also encourage you, you know, to use the chat function for that. But the best would be if you could send us at the end of uh, this webinar uh, a slide mentioning your idea, your contact details. If you want them to be shared, then we can upload them on our Euraxis website and also share them with the participants. So this is up to you, like how you want to connect uh, and reach out. But um, the way is either now during the webinar to the chat function, or you send us, you know, a one slide with your contact details and the project kind of idea you have, so we can kind of. Uh, you know, share it with all the participants. So yeah, that's that's it uh, from my side for now. Uh, Vivek, uh, floor is yours. Thank you, Samrat. Uh, are you able to hear me? Yeah, and we are able to see slide. Yeah, slide also perfect. Perfect. Thank you, Samrat. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to give you a brief overview about uh, the co-funding modalities. Uh, uh, what is the government of India's rules and regulation of participation as well as uh, from the European Commission side as well. As uh, Burna, uh, Bunwa uh, correctly mentioned, this is very important topic and very timely because yesterday my son was uh, introducing me to the chat uh, GPT and already this AI is on our desktop and on mobiles. So um, uh, it is very uh, important, uh, this uh, topic uh, uh, of AI. So uh, this is a joint presentation uh, with the DST and uh, European uh, side. 
So on behalf of uh, DST and EU, I'm going to give uh, a presentation to uh, all. Okay, so this is what I'm going to cover in next uh, 15, 20 minutes. So I will give you a brief idea where to find the call uh, text, the deadlines, uh, co-funding from uh, modalities, uh, the eligibility uh, of uh, Horizon Europe, as well as the Indian eligibility, admissibility of the proposal, uh, what is covered under the funding from Indian side and European side, uh, then also how to submit the proposal and timeline. So these are the important points I will cover in next uh, uh, 15, 20 minutes. So this is the call. Uh, so the call is right now open and it will close on 29th of March, uh, 2023. Uh, so this is a very important deadline because uh, there is no extension of deadlines. There is nothing changed in the timing. So be careful with the timing of the call. And this call is available. Uh, the entire complete text of uh, this call is available on the Europe, Euro, Horizon Europe funding and tender portal. So this is the only authentic, legally uh, correct um, text which is available. Uh, and should be referred while propose, uh, preparing the proposal. So please uh, note down the, the address. Uh, I will also share my slides uh, after the uh, presentation, after the, after the session. So the Horizon Europe uh, Funding and Theater Portal is the correct website to get the authentic legal uh, call text of this particular call. This call also has a hyperlink given in the uh, DST's uh, co-funding modalities. So the DST had in detail explained what is the legal uh, administrative and regulations of the co-funding that needs to be followed by the Indian entities. So this, um, they had given this entire document uh, quite explicitly explain this document, what should be done and what should not be done in the while pre preparing the proposal. So uh, who can participate? Uh, basically uh, from Horizon Europe, by default, it is open to almost all countries. Any legal entities, it could be big or small companies, SMEs, startups, research organizations, universities, um, you, you name it, who has a capacity to deliver on research um, uh, you know, challenge which has been defined is most welcome to be part of this uh, particular um, consortium or to uh, a team which is trying to uh, put forward the proposal. From the government of India side, uh, the eligibility is any research institutes, it could be central or state funded research institutes or public or private universities. Uh, also the national and state funded research labs and universities as well. So these are the uh, institutions which can participate. The private entities, it could be SMEs, big uh, corporates, as well as the um, startups can participate in this uh, consortium on its own funding. So the Horizon Europe uh, proposal eligibility, this is very important. I will uh, spend a couple of minutes on it because this is very important to understand how the multilateral um, you know, consortium works, how this Horizon uh, will work. You need to have at least three legal entities from European member state or, or associated countries out of and these three legal entities from three different uh, you know, member states, either this is the list of member states, that is the 27 member state which European Union has, or associated countries. There are, as of today, 16 associated countries are associated with this program. So you need to have three entities from three different countries. Out of that, one should be from the, uh, the group of 27 member state, and the two could be member state or the associated country. Okay, so this is a basic requirement <clears throat> to be qualified, to be uh, your proposal to be admissible. So make sure the three uh, entities from three European countries should be part of that. So apart from that, to benefit from the Indian uh, government's co-funding eligibility, basically the India's participation is highly encouraged in this particular call. Okay, but this is not an eligibility condition of Horizon Europe, but it is an eligibility condition of the DST. So the DST encourage one or more entities from India 
to be part of this um, uh, consortium or the project proposal so that the impact of project in Indian context is larger. So out of that one or more entities, one has to be a publicly funded uh, uh, research or uh, institute or university. So that is the prerequisite from the DST side. And the proposal must include three minimum three European uh, member state or associated partners, one or more uh, European uh, Indian partner or more than you know, as the program is uh, open for any country, you can add any entities from across the world who can add the benefit or additional dimension to the project. So there is no limit. So the please check um, uh, additional eligibility condition in the call text. I just took a screenshot of this. So make sure you read the eligibility of the call text very carefully. There is the call text specifically mentioned that the activity should include TRL, that is the technology readiness level, should start at two to three level and should achieve at the time of project completion, the TRL level four to five, okay? In addition, there is a um, uh, statement saying, in order to achieve the expected outcome, international cooperation is encouraged in particularly with Canada and India. So Indian entities had an additional value, additional um, you know, uh, aspects to add into it. So please make sure this um, uh, you know uh, sentence or this uh, require requirement is highlighted to the Europeans so that the Indians has a major role into the consortium. So who is eligible for Horizon Europe funding? Uh, there could be different scenarios. EU funding is going directly to the 27 European member state entities, as well as the 16 associated countries, plus European Union also funding 120 low and middle income uh, countries. But the European Commission under the Horizon Europe uh, program don't fund high economy um, uh, countries or entities coming from the uh, developed and emerging economies. So what it is, so basically, uh, these are the countries, this is listed, uh, you can name it China, uh, India, Brazil, US, Japan, Korea, you name, these are the big economies, they, they can be partner with the Europeans, but the funding is not provided directly. So there are three uh, scenarios under which the funding could be available for these uh, entities coming from these big uh, countries. One is exceptional uh, funding, which is one scenario. Another is co-funding and specific provision. But I will only focus on co-funding aspects because government of India had agreed those entities, Indian entities who are selected uh, um, under this particular call will be eligible for government of India's funding. So government of India's co-funding conditions, the Indian entities to compile the entire national rules and regulations mentioned in their guidelines. So please go through the, um, the DST's guideline very carefully. The proposal not submitted to both funding agencies that is not admissible. So you need to have one proposal submission at the European side. The same proposal has to be submitted at the Indian funding agency that is DST. The Co-funding will be provided to a proposal where Indian entity is part, which is positively evaluated by both the sides. Okay, so that means evaluated by the European Commission as well as the Indian side as well. So though then only the Indian entities will be eligible for the DST funding. So <clears throat> the Indian entities will not sign European Commission grant agreement and the duration of the project could be from up to three years. So this is very important to understand and study carefully before you enter into the project proposal formation. Technology readiness level, as this is the definition which is available on the Horizon Europe um, guidelines and the guidebook. I had just copied it for your uh, understanding. So the TRL two and three should be the starting point. And what is expected, it should be uh, completed between TRL four or five, that is large scale, prototype that is what expected at the end of the project proposal. So who is eligible for the DST funding? Any public or private academic institutions, universities, research institutions, nationally and state nationally and state funded laboratories are eligible for DST funding, must have um, well established research uh, support system. They should have um, the document and the service which called as the public finance management system. This is mandatory because without 
that the Indian government cannot fund these public entities. Industry uh, can be part, the startups can be part of this proposal. They have no issues, but the only thing, the, uh, they can bring their own funding to the proposal. So this is this specific co-funding is available only uh, to us four calls, which has been identified the DST are applicable to those calls only. So what is covered under the government of India's co-funding? This is basically a grant in aid. So 100% funding, eligible cost, capacity, uh, capital expenditure, manpower. This is the standard uh, expenditures which the um, uh, research project they avail. And in addition, uh, the government of India had put the cap of 1.5 crores, that is almost 160,000 euros equivalent amount will be contributed to the per project by, from the Indian side. So admissibility, as I mentioned, the proposal should be jointly developed by Indian, uh, the European, Indian and other partners. Uh, there, there are two parts, part A and B. I will come to that part later on. The submission of this particular um, proposal uh, will be at two places. One is to the uh, European Commission's funder and tender portal. The same proposal uh, has to be submitted to the uh, government of India's um, palm, uh, portal, uh, that is the DST portal. And in addition, you have to add the detailed expenditure uh, and financial formats which have been given by government of India. Your detailed budget should be explained to the in, uh, DST. This proposal should be part A, part B of the European, um, uh, the entire proposal submitted to Horizon Europe, plus the annexes should be submitted to EPMS online system of government of India within seven working days after the closure of the call. So the call is closing on 29th of uh, March. Uh, so it will be after there is a grace period given by the government of India. So after that seven days you have a working seven days to submit the proposal. Uh, complete, make sure the entire application form is complete, readable, printable to the funders. So this is what the submission process the one uh, part A and part B, that is uh, the uh, uh, format of European side will be going to the um, funding and to uh, tender portal. This uh, exercise will be done by the European coordinator and the DST's uh, EPMS system will be done by the Indian lead PI and he or she will submit the entire proposal online to the DST. So this is what a uh, very important part of the entire exercise to formation of consortium, finding a partner, being as we are a funder, we are not in as such a matchmaking, but we give a platform to the entities to find the partners to express your interest, project ideas or expertise available. So there are different online tools and sessions um, organized by European commissions and NCPs and Euraxis across the world to bring best people across the world to come together to form the consortium and solve this problem. So today's break, breakout event, the brokerage event is one part of this exercise. Uh, there is also below the call, there is also partner uh, matchmaking uh, tool available uh, that can be also explored. So the consortium formation, I will repeat again because this is the basic uh, uh, prerequisite to form the um, proposal, Th three organizations from three different European member states or associated country, out of that one should be from the member state. Additional legal entities, for example, from Europe, from India or any part of the world can be added. So on an average, the horizon proposals are seven to 15 entities are forming a consortium. Partner, uh, the proposal are most welcome in the multidisciplinary, cross-sectoral, cross-border participation is highly encouraged. Make sure the gender balance is also taken in consideration because that also has an additional value in assessment now. Uh, the project proposal uh, should be coordinated by the European uh, coordinator and that he or she will be dealing directly with the European Commission for the submission and the fund release and fund grant agreement. One lead scientific coordinator will be communicating with the DST for submission and the funding nego um, uh, negotiations. So uh, it's very important the government of India and European Commission strongly advise the con consortiums to pay attention at the time of consortium formation 
the ipr uh, that is ownership protections and user rights should be taken care because these are most new fields market oriented fields so please go through these guidelines at the time of consortium formation itself so the consortium agreement is the only document you will be signing uh between the partners because that is the only uh, document you will assured uh, each other's work packages to be delivered on time so application form as i mentioned the horizon europe application form is divided in part a and part b part a is more a structured format where the information is filled up by the european coordinator on the horizon europe uh, portal and part b is more a scientific proposal which is download it has a format you can form your um, project proposal it has a page limit i think it is 70 page is the uh, page limit for the scientific proposal and that can be uploaded after uh, the submission after the uh, taking inputs from different consortium members in addition you can also have different uh, annexes uh, to be added so type of participants the european side will be considered as a beneficiary for the european horizon program so that is 27 member state per associated countries but the indian partners will be um, participating in the project proposal as a associated partner because they are not receiving the european money so they will be termed as a associated partner you don't have to sign the european grant agreement so what is associated partner the associated partner receive the co funding from the respective government and they will sign the respective government's uh, grant agreement uh, that is with the dst so make sure you inform your coordinator that you should be uh, considered as an associated partner at the time of consortium formation itself uh, you need to have a pic that is the um, participant ID identification code uh, the plenty of information is available most of the indian uh, entities uh, have this uh, already registered number uh, so information is available and you will be signing the consortium agreement that is the only document you will submit to both the funders uh, saying confirming that you are committed to the work so uh, the budget formation the indian side don't have to give the budget details you only will give the lump sum amount which is you required for your project proposal for your work package delivery so that information should be added by the european coordinator into the part a of the budget formation so this is the format and you, there is a specific drop down for associated partner make sure your lump sum amount the global uh, total gross amount should be mentioned no more um, details are uh, is needed for the european commission uh for the budget uh, part the evaluation will be first done by the horizon europe evaluation criteria that is excellence impact and implementation once that proposal is positively evaluated by the european uh, commission under the horizon europe uh, program that proposal will be uh, evaluated by the government of india on national um, uh, criteria and the proposal which is positively evaluated by both the sides will be co-funded by the government of india that is the eu indian entities will receive the co-funding from the government of india so the horizon europe timeline so the proposal is open since last 3 months so the it will close in uh, 29th march the evaluation will be done within 5 months and the grant agreement so the entire process of um, closing from the closing to the grant agreement is 8 months so we anticipate the government of india will also complete this grant release within that period so that the project proposals can start on time so these are the different sources these are the different um, uh, online platforms where you can be uh, um, useful for identifying different partners i will leave the, those slides with you uh, so um, again this is uh, Uh, you need to access the european uh, website so you need to have a eu login id so this information uh, is available but most of the people will have this information uh, ready so this is what the peak is but i will leave the slides with you uh, irrespective whether you will be part of the proposal you want to be uh, consortium formation or not we need a lot of experts across the world if you think if you are not part of the proposal you are not putting the proposal submission you can register as an uh, european union expert 
so we have a big, we need a lot of people we we have a big pool of uh, uh, international experts you can re register in our system as an expert evaluator this is not only about the expertise but european commission also pay you quite handsomely for your efforts so uh, this website is there i will leave the uh, slides and website with you so that you can from the, uh, you can also enter as an expert. This is the team from uh, European side and uh, the EU delegation side and the DST side. We are more than happy to help you out if you need any help. I think I will stop it here and I will, I'm ready to answer any questions you have uh, with me. Thank you, Samrat, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Vivek. Uh, it's a very clear presentation and um, also the modalities for the Indian side. Uh, I think you have very uh, well outlined it to us. Um, I'm, I'm seeing that there is a, a question uh, and there's also uh, um, from one of the participants is, uh, Vivek, if, what about a private company who's working in, 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 in AI uh, with a strong research lab? Uh, private companies are also eligible to apply uh, for this call? Yeah, so from the European side, the private industry, uh, the European 27 member state, I, as I mentioned, associated countries and 120 small uh, lower economies, anybody can participate. From the Indian government side, participation is highly encouraged, but they can bring their own funding. Private industries are not funded by the government of India, that is DST. They are only funding the universities, institutes, be it a private or public, okay? So in short, the private entities are not funded directly by government of India. They have to bring their own funding when they are participating into the project proposal. Okay. Okay. That's great. Um, I see that uh, one of our uh, panelists, Dr. Chetan has raised his hand. Dr. Chetan, uh, would you like to ask a question uh, to Dr. Vivek regarding the presentation or? Yes, sir. Are you... yes, okay. Sir. Perfect. Yeah, please. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, Dr. Vivek, sir. I'm Chetan from Rajkot, from RK University. Uh, my question is that uh, uh, we are a private university uh, in Gujarat. Uh, the name is RK University. So as you mentioned that uh, uh, private university and government funded universities are eligible. Correct. Okay. And uh, so uh, with this, I would like I would like to know that you are mentioning that uh, three EU state member, uh, something like that. So uh, yes. what it is actually, what is there if we are pre preparing for any proposal? So we have to take care of any kind of that kind of thing as a private university? No, see, these are the European Horizon Europe program. Okay. okay. So the basic, these are multilateral uh, project. It's not a bilateral, what Indo-French, Indo-German. It okay. is a EU, uh, you need to have more than... Um, three uh, entities like from European side, you need to have three European partners from three different countries. Oh, Out okay. of that, one should be from a European member state and then you okay. can multiply for that. So this okay. is the basic eligibility criteria okay. of the proposal. And you have to understand that these are multilateral uh, you know, stakeholder projects. So these are big projects. Okay, okay. So as a, as a, as a private university, uh, we are in India. So we are definitely eligible for that. Yes, you are eligible for a DST funding. Make sure that one public entity uh, should be partner with you because the DST, if you read the guidelines carefully, they will transfer the money to the public institute account directly and then they will redistribute or they will uh, uh, the, this thing. But the public institution should be one public institution should be part of with you. Okay, sir. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you, Vivek, for, for clarifying uh, this aspect to Dr. Chetan. And with that, uh, looking at the time, uh, I say we would uh, we move on uh, to our next speakers. Um, and um, the next part will be about presenting the scope of the call. So there will be a more in-depth understanding for all of you what this call is about and who better than our dear colleagues from Brussels uh, can explain this call to us. And I would like to welcome now um, Ms. Evangelia Marquido and uh, Mr. Kimo Rossi. Uh, Evangelia is the head of sector artificial intelligence, uh, technology development and impact at DG Connect at the European Commission in Brussels. 
And uh, Mr. Timo Rossi is the head of sector research and innovation execution in the data value chain, DG Connect as well, the same uh, director general uh, at the European Commission. So very good morning to both of you. Um, thank you so much for joining and welcome back uh, Evangelia uh, to India, virtually to India and also a very good morning to uh, Kimo. The floor is yours. Thanks a lot for the very good introduction. I don't think we need to reintroduce ourselves, but you did a very good job. So thanks a lot for, and for having us uh, presenting this very important, I think, for us topic. Uh, as you said, uh, we are both here uh, presenting this because this is a joint topic even within the Commission. It's rare, but it becomes more and more uh, common that uh, this kind of technologies kind of in, uh, converge with others. So we we sat together and we kind of uh, drafted this topic. As you will see from the title, and now I'm not sure if whether we share or you will share the, the slides for us. This is a topic that was uh, co-created with the... Yes? Would you like us to share it or are you okay to share it? It would be fine if you can share it because I usually oh. with the Zoom have issues with the uh, boxes. Okay. So it, it uh, as, you, as you probably know or don't know that in Horizon Europe, we have uh, public private partnerships that are called European partnerships. And uh, together with Kimo, our two units are responsible for the European partnership on AI data and robotics. And they, uh, together uh, the, the private side and us, uh, the, the public side of the partnership co-created this topic, which is very important and very also uh, given the current situation also with the, the energy crisis, a uh, very spot on. Uh, it is uh, now still open and the deadline is uh, end of March. Let's see if you, if you want, we can share or is, is it going to be shared? Is it actually, I, uh, no, I, I actually, I, I, I don't think I have received it from uh, you. I don't have it. So at least if you could share it. Okay, give me one moment. So in the meantime, uh, while Evangelia is opening the slides, let me introduce myself. Um, so I'm Kim Rossi. Uh, I'm, uh, and, and first of all, to correct something, we are not in Brussels. So we are located, our directorate is uh, located uh, in uh, Luxembourg, which is like 250 kilometers uh, east of uh, uh, Brussels. Um, and uh, also uh, Evangelia's unit A1, uh, is located uh, here in Luxembourg. So we work in the same building. And um, um, so as Evangelia said, the reason why we, there are two of us here and not one person is because this is a truly joint effort uh, between um, the uh, data portfolio and the AI portfolio that uh, our two respective units are responsible for. And uh, that we have a, have a history um, uh, in our unit, uh, managing a data uh, partnership, um, uh, you may have called, uh, heard uh, BDVA, uh, Big Data Value Association. So that was a previous Horizon 2020 partnership that uh, we supported in our unit. And uh, uh, now we have been supporting data uh, pooling and data sharing projects, uh, analytics, uh, prediction, and uh, we realized often that the data uh, nowadays is mostly used for uh, training AI systems. So that gave us the idea to uh, devise a joint topic in the work program, Horizon Europe work program, how to use data for AI. So this is how this topic uh, was born. Now I give it back to uh, Evangelia as uh, she has put the slides on the screen. So I hope, yes, thanks a lot, Kim. I hope you can see them now. I, I guess you can see them. Yes, yes, okay. perfect. So the, the topic is called Efficient Trustworthy AI, making the best of data. And I think some also would call it frugal AI, but this is the kind of uh, a very important topic for both our units. And it's true. I mean, the, there is a huge convergence between AI and data. And we thought this would be better to kind of join forces into a joint topic and make sure really that we address all the aspects around this, this area. So it has a total budget, and that is, of course, the EU funding for which you will uh, you will not be eligible. But the total EU funding is 35 million, and the 
EU contribution per project is estimated between seven and nine million, as you will guess. We will have a maximum probably between four or, or five uh, projects. Uh, the TRL, uh, as usually for the research innovation actions, starts around two to three and should reach at the end of the project four to five. So the eligibility conditions, all of that are, are described in the general Annex B. I think you all have also access to the topic description on the website. And there are some uh, exceptions that will apply and maybe Kimo can also explain something on those exceptions. But these are related to the, to data that can be uh, taken from uh, Galileo's or Co Coper Galileo or Copernicus. And of course, to ensure a balanced portfolio, but we will explain later on, uh, the, we will look into the coverage. So the grants will be awarded to applications, not only in the order of ranking and the maximum points they will get, but at least uh, to the highest rank proposal for each of the two focus areas. Uh, provided, of course, that the, the applications attain all thresholds. So, which means we have two sub areas. We will make sure to at least fund the highest score in sub area one and the highest score uh, proposal in sub area two. And then, uh, depending on the ranking order, all the highest ones uh, after those. And then, independent of the, the to uh, focus area. What we're looking for is uh, really to optimize the AI solutions, to optimize the model design and the data usage, to maximize the accuracy and the robustness of the AI systems, to ensure, in general, the pipeline of high quality, representative, and unbiased, but also compliant training data for AI development in all relevant sectors. It's very important here also in line also with a trustworthy AI, that really the quality of the data is very important to us. And, and of course, to support the data preparation and the AI training processes that do lead to efficient and more trustworthy AI. Over to you, Kimo. Thank you. So uh, this is a, a very important slide. And this is taken from the work program. So as uh, uh, you have uh, heard already from Dr. Dam, it's very important uh, to, to read the text in the work program. So whatever we say here is less important than what is written in the work program, because that is the law. So it uh, outlines these two alternative uh, or complementary focus points that your project may address. Uh, first of all, uh, the first uh, possible focus point is uh, um, automated A and AI-based mining harvesting, selection, cleaning, annotation, enrichment, augmentation of data for AI. So to uh, feed AI with data. So having uh, you may have a, a, an em emphasis on supplying uh, and processing, enriching the data for AI. Or to generate uh, using synthetic data uh, in order to escape uh, from this uh, need to use uh, real world data if it's proves problematic to use it, or if there is not enough. Uh, if you think you can multiply uh, the data by using synthetic data, uh, that is also goes to this uh, first uh, focus uh, area, or uh, uh, validating the efficiency of these uh, data uh, provision processes in AI systems. So the first uh, bullet point is, uh, is uh, data focused. And the second one is uh, 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 focusing more on the AI models, uh, but still from the data uh, use point of view. So to how to have uh, uh, develop uh, lighter, less data intensive, less energy consuming models that do not need necessarily massive amounts uh, of real world data when that is uh, simply not available or is very expensive or has uh, some uh, uh, conditions of copyright or, or privacy that, that cannot be uh, satisfied. Uh, optimized learning processes that require less input, so data efficient uh, AI uh, without re degrading the quality of the output, without sacrificing the, 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 the quality and, and uh, the result. Uh, machine learning methods and architectures that deal with volumes such as uh, lower volumes of uh, data, uh, such as uh, transfer uh, learning, one should learning continuous and lifelong learning. So all these are examples, does not necessarily an exhaustive list of possible uh, methods um, that use uh, data smart, more uh, smartly, or uh, can do with less data uh, and uh, more frugal in that sense. So uh, what is important that in your proposal, you uh, clearly indicate which of these two uh, 
focus areas your proposal addresses so whether it's the first or the second one uh, it's important to say uh, uh, to put this um, uh, forward uh, concretely because uh, it will have an effect on uh, on the uh, selection of projects so not for ranking ranking will be based on the scores of the proposals but there is a rule which says that uh, that um, we will fund at least one one uh, proposal from from e for each of these uh, areas uh, if they are above thresholds. So of course, if there is nothing above thresholds for for the other uh, bullet point, then uh, cannot be uh, funded. But uh, if there is like uh, uh, all the top ranking proposals are for the first bullet point, and then there are uh, uh, proposals scoring 11 points uh, and less for the second. Uh, we will fund uh, another also a, a proposal on the second bullet point, uh, even if it scores uh, lower, if it's that's the high rank, most high ranking proposal for that uh, category or addressing the second bullet point. So that's why it is very important uh, to indicate. But otherwise, if you don't indicate uh, the uh, uh, focus area that you are addressing, uh, then you leave this choice to the evaluators and they may not uh, come to the to the right conclusion or the conclusion that you you have in mind uh, and uh, now uh, i hope i underlined this clearly enough uh, all in all uh, the work program uh, is the law and that you should always read this in the context of the full work program text and now back to evangelia thanks a lot Kim. so yes uh, it, this is very important. So everything that we usually highlight also in red is something that really uh, you proposer should pay attention to. So what uh, additional information, which is important for this topic, really, we want proposals uh, to see proposals that really contribute to, to increase the data efficiency and the energy efficiency of AI and rationalize the provision of data for AI. I mean, we see all now with the rise of chat GPT uh, and the, the rise of large language models and multimodal models, the need of really uh, uh, huge uh, data sets, but those kind of models are very energy hungry and we don't believe that this is necessarily sustainable and also really in, in line with uh, how we want to achieve uh, also uh, a general artificial intelligence. So really it's what we look forward in this kind of topic is really the data efficiency and the energy efficiency of uh, uh, AI. And the work should uh, support also appropriate AI paradigms, whether they're central, distributed, dynamic, hybrid. As Kimo said, we give a few examples, but we will really want to see proposals that respond and adapt easily to the needs of the use situation, uh, the, whichever use cases are going to be selected, and to the change in characteristics, availability, and use conditions for data. And the target AI system should be appropriately also evaluated and results analyzed and fed back to ensure the continuous improvement of the data for AI. AI pipeline. Uh, the proposal really needs to describe, this is important, it's, please read the topic description. It needs to describe the characteristics and the availability of the data that is going to be used within the project and also explain how possible privacy or IPR issues are being addressed that relate to the data to be used. And in order to achieve, of course, the expected outcomes, and this is, uh, we are happy that present, we present this also today. We really encourage international cooperation, in particular then with Canada and India, because there are also ongoing discussions and task forces uh, with uh, India. We really are happy also uh, to be here today to present this topic. And I think these type of topics really require international cooperation to really progress and achieve uh, energy efficiency in these areas. Uh, the type of stakeholders that we address, really academic research organizations, but also industry, uh, including uh, SMEs and startups. And the key group of actors that drive, of course, this is the AI Data and Robotics Partnership. As I said in the beginning, that was this topic was also co-created together with the private side of the partnership. And I think with this, we finished our presentation and we are open for questions. Uh, I have to say I already answered one question in the chat okay. and uh, it is a very characteristic, characteristic question also because I noticed that in the in the uh, brokerage presentations later on uh, after our presentation there are uh, proposals that address several application areas so that are clearly application area oriented like like uh, healthcare or agriculture and people are keen to know is this topic, is this application area uh, in, in scope for, for this topic? Can I 
like the one I answered was um, addressing agriculture. Can I address uh, AI in agriculture in this topic? Uh, the answer is that we do not actually mention any uh, application areas in the work program text, and that is for a purpose, because uh, we do not want to restrict the application areas. Also, we do not want to give any specific benefit or additional points to any particular application area. As long as uh, the challenges that, that we presented and that are in the work program, as, lo as long as the proposal fully uh, responds to those. So these data pipelines for AI, the smarter use of data for AI, uh, and that it really makes a difference to, to previously uh, employed methods in that sense. Uh, and you can demonstrate that in, uh, in any, let's say, reasonable um, application area, any reasonable, any, any area that, that will effectively demonstrate uh, the, the, the superiority of, of your, your, your method. I, I hope uh, that's sufficient because then this is an answer to all those questions that are, are about the different application domains that asking is this domain okay. <laughs> it it can be it can be okay. <laughs> I agree. I agree because uh, uh, what what also is particular to this cluster is really that in cluster four we focus on the technology. So the the the, the, the applications or use cases selected are just to demonstrate the progress of the technology. So it is up to the proposers then to to decide where they can best demonstrate uh, this uh, progress. Thank you so much, uh, both of you, and yeah, thank you, Kimo. Right? Yeah, I yeah, um, uh, I, I just received a question, very important question. Can I ask? Mm -hmm. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. Please go ahead. Yeah, uh, anyone of you can answer because it's related to ethics. Because this is uh, topic is quite uh, uh, cross sectoral from health to agriculture. So, can you elaborate a little bit of ethical um, aspects of this um, proposal? What should be taken care at the time of proposal preparation? Your guidance will be valuable. It, it's something that, that is general for all topics, actually, uh, that uh, the ethics, issue are hand, ethics issues are handled in a similar manner. Uh, so this topic is no different from other topics in Horizon Europe. There is an ethics questionnaire as part of the proposal. Uh, and indeed, since uh, the Indian participant will be an associated partner, so not actually signing the, the grant agreement, so it's very important that the whoever is the European coordinator of your proposal. So the European coordinator who will be submitting the proposal to the participant portal is uh, very well aware of the ethics questionnaire part of the, uh, of the submission forms, and that will fill it correctly, uh, indicating any uh, possible ethical issues arising uh, from, from uh, for, for example, uh, from using uh, personal data, patient uh, data in, in the uh, project, for example, those will just need to be described in the, in the questionnaire. And if uh, then, uh, if a proposal then is successfully selected uh, from an evaluation, so if, it's, if it passes the technical evaluation, in the technical evaluation, uh, ethics issues will not, be, will not be assessed. But if it passes the technical evaluation, it will then uh, go to uh, ethical assessment. So only the successful proposals will go to ethical assessment, where ethics experts will, uh, will assess whether the ethical concerns have been correctly uh, addressed in the, in the proposal. And if not, what needs to be done, what needs to be put in place, what additional deliverables have to be put in place. Uh, Evangelia can, can uh, uh, complement on that if, uh, if, if she wants. Yes, uh, on, on, I mean, yeah. in indeed i mean uh, when uh, when applying automatically i mean the questionnaire is there and whenever it comes to data or ai topics uh, the ethics experts are very also thorough in looking that everything is being addressed. Uh, we also look uh, in, in all the AI topics about the technical robustness of the proposed AI system. So there are a lot of aspects where uh, also in the evaluation, but also afterwards. So in all steps of this, uh, this process, we look into ethics, but in different kind of uh, 
uh, in a, in a variety. So the questionnaire is, then has to be kind of also cross-checked afterwards with the ethics evaluation, whether indeed everything has been taken into account. But of course, you know that when uh, the, all the projects in Europe have to also then everything that is going on in Europe has to also be in line with any kind of regulation, whether it's GDPR or any other upcoming uh, regulation that is enforced. Uh, two more questions um, quickly. Anyone can take it. Uh, I just receive on WhatsApp. Uh, specific to TRL, because this is very difficult to identify in, in, in the new field of AI. Uh, is there any guidelines you want to give on TRL levels? And the second question is related to, um, okay, uh, just a minute. No, uh, first, you go with the TRL and then I come back to the another question. Okay. I mean, ideally, it should be possible to show, you know, which kind of TRL level. I know the Commission looks into that. If it was for specific areas, it's more difficult. But I'll tell you what is equally important to really show this is the current state of the art. And this is where we want to, this is what we want to reach, the progress beyond the state of the art and the methodology. So there are aspects in the proposal that are very important. I mean, with the TRL, I think it should be mentioned somewhere now if it's very difficult to uh, explain uh, specifically which level i would say it, it what is equally and maybe more important is really to show the state of the art and the progress beyond the state of the art especially for research innovation actions and also the methodology the methodology and the state of the art aspects are the most important in the the, the most important criterion in this evaluation which is the excellence criterion kimo maybe you want to add Yes, yeah, so uh, I'm very thankful to Dr. Dam that he presented the, the TRL uh, on uh, TRL levels on his slide so that you can see what it means, what is TRL one, from one to nine. Um, it's already a good start. So, but uh, it's true that it may not be very helpful uh, or it may be difficult to assess maturity of, of your work. Uh, and especially the starting uh, grades and, and then, uh, but the important thing is that, that, that you make progress. We are not obsessed by the TRLs, but if we say that uh, the project, uh, by the end of the project, uh, uh, it should reach TRL level four and, or five, uh, then you should demonstrate and, and describe this somehow, somewhere. I have seen proposals previously where they had a whole table of different uh, component uh, areas and technologies and uh, from which TRL they start and, and at which TRL they will reach in three years time when the project is over. Very, very analytic approaches. I have seen others that only say in one paragraph of text that uh, this is the start and this is where we uh, we are envisaging to end. I think more important than the levels is that you will make a serious attempt to assess and analyze the progress that you are going to uh, uh, realize to that state of the art because obviously pro proposals that uh, that have uh, that present very little uh, progress to the existing uh, state of the art will not stand very high in, in the evaluation, will not uh, have a high, high score in the excellence criterion. Uh, on the other hand, if you claim that you will proceed from TRL2 to TRL7, it may not be very credible. Uh, evaluators may say that this is nonsense, uh, this will not happen, simply not happen. This is why we do not require uh, any spectacular leaps uh, so from three to uh, from two two or three to four to five, uh, it's really uh, uh, it's really a matter of uh, making a, a difference. Uh, so going from technology concept uh, to a uh, to something that is validated in relevant environment. I think TRL five. Uh, the important thing uh, in TRL five is that the technology is validated in a relevant environment. Uh, and uh, it can be, and in many, many cases, it's an industrial, uh, industrial uh, environment. It does not have to be uh, a, a real scale um, a system, fully operational system. No, because we are funding uh, research and innovation actions, which is by, by definition a, a lower TRL uh, action. So we are, we are um, uh, um, uh, tolerant for the fact that that uh, that you don't have to come up with with a um, a commercial operational system as a result of the project, but it should be something that 
that can be can already be validated uh, that it's mature enough to be validated and it's logical because you have to validate it with real data uh, that's one of the conditions of the call that that you have to so show with what data you are using and to validate the concept with real data so maybe that's that's enough about the trl levels so don't be too much obsessed uh, uh, with those uh, numbers yeah uh, my last question and very relevant and um, uh, important because the call text does mention that international uh, participation is encouraged specifically to achieve the goals and the participation from india and canada is highly encouraged so can you elaborate what additional aspects this uh, entity should bring into the proposal when you anticipate india into the proposal I think uh, uh, the reason why we, we mentioned specifically these countries is because there is ongoing collaboration or discussion also among researchers and everything. And we believe that this is a very important topic for, for both sides, uh, the energy efficiency, frugality of AI, and also looking forward uh, so on sustainability. So I think what we would like to see, I mean, is uh, partners that really complement, because usually we start with a European consortium, somebody starts bringing in the partners. It can also start from India, but you need to have, of course, the European European partners. And then what is really important, and this is something we look into the third criterion when we evaluate, is really the complementarity and the expertise of the partners. So that the Indian partners should really complement and bring this kind of added value. I mean, proposals that will not have Indian partners will not be penalized. But I mean, if you show also the additional added value of having the Indian partners, it will also be considered, of course, in the proposal as an added value, as an additional kind of uh, benefit. So it's really complementarity of the expertise and then the expertise. And then also what we look for is really to have the best kind of uh, experts in an area. But what Kimo said is important, really, we want really see an progress beyond of the state of the art was we usually have a slide when we present it uh, at info days is what we do not want to see and that is kind of a incremental progress we really want to see a huge progress so th that is the, the the important aspect i think in this proposal the state of the art point and the methodology and and thanks earlier that you said and, and welcomed experts to also register at our database because we also look to 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 a contract indian experts to help us evaluating this uh, topic But only if you are not uh, involved yeah, in the proposal. Yeah, so if there's no conflict, of course. I think you mentioned it earlier, Dr. Damso. Uh, yeah, uh, Lina, uh, can you also have a reference with the uh, TTC, the Technology and Trade Council? Does it have any connections with this particular call? The EU India Technology and Trade Council announcement, does it have any connection? Mm, I don't, don't know this announcement, so probably no, because sometimes even with the commission, we are not really communicating uh, but i think this this is an area where everybody will start focusing now so maybe i mean i'll, I'll have to look at the announcement unless kimo knows it but uh, there is no clear link okay thank you i see benoit uh, maybe what wanted to say something on that yes maybe i can i can help here evangelia because i've been following more about this trade and technology council what i can what i can share at present is that it's uh, it's a forum which is more at high level political level it's bringing a steer of several ministers from india um including the the minister for commerce the minister for uh, electronic and uh, and it um and uh, uh, also uh, from and and also the minister the minister of external affairs and from from in from eu uh, that will be held under two commissioners the commissioner for trade dombrovsky and the commissioner for digital transformation vestager so it's really here to give a political steer of uh, collaboration uh, and that's government to government of course um, with the adoption of further political commitments, such as the one that I mentioned on artificial intelligence task force, for instance, that will then translate into practical uh, collaboration, including collaboration in research, but it's not directly linked. We are at a higher level, mm. political level. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, uh, Benoit, uh, for the intervention. And uh, also, thank you so much to uh, our two speakers from Luxembourg. I'll remember that, that uh, 
your uh, DG is not in Brussels, so it's good for me to know. Uh, thank you so much uh, for you know uh, the presentation, also taking the questions and you know um, helping us to better understand uh, the scope of the call. Uh, with that, uh, we go now to the next part of, of, of this uh, afternoon session here in India, uh, which is now to look at uh, some of the uh, researchers who have uh, sent us uh, flash presentations who have uh, very interesting ideas and are looking for partners. So uh, I'd like to welcome uh, all of them. And uh, we will start uh, with our first presenter, which is Dr. Uh, Surajit Basak. He's from um, ICMR, the National Institute of Cholera and Enteric Diseases in Kolkata. Uh, very warm welcome to you. Please to all the presenters, uh, due to the, the time regime, uh, no more than seven minutes uh, for your presentation, please, so, so that we are fair to, to all uh, who are presenting today. Okay, with that, I say, Dr. Surajit, uh, please start your presentation and uh, all the best. Good afternoon to all of you. Hi, uh, good afternoon to all of you. So today I'm going to present uh, a prediction model using mostly machine learning approaches for viral disease outbreak. Now for the last three years, we have seen the devastation caused by SARS-CoV-2 all over the world. And uh, during this journey, we have also uh, come across to meet several of the variants of SARS-CoV-2 starting from alpha, then uh, uh, beta, and then uh, to some extent gamma also, then delta, and then finally we, we, are, uh, uh, we are living with Omicron. So during this entire journey, some of the variants like alpha or delta has caused much devastation to our life. And also finally the Omicron has been settled down uh, to our in, into our population. So basically from this entire uh, journey, what uh, we have seen that if some of the variants like alpha, delta, that has caused much devastation in terms of number of deaths. But while considering the Omicron variants, which is much more infective, but in terms of number of deaths, the situation is to some extent better compared to other uh, uh, delta or uh, alpha. So that means the potential to cause uh, such devastation varies from different, uh, from strain to strain. And that, that footprint is actually uh, present uh, in their uh, overall genetic makeup. So keeping this in mind, this proposal we are, I am planning to uh, formulate where using this machine learning approach, we, we want to uh, set up such model through which we can predict whether uh, any emerging or re-emerging virus can uh, create such havoc what we have seen during these last three years. So the topic that I, I, I want to address is a novel machine learning model to predict the potential of a virus to cause an outbreak. So here in this model, we will consider both the genetic data or the uh, whole genome sequence data, and also at the same time, the clinical data uh, or epidemiological data, because when the evolution is an ongoing process, and uh, again, I'm referring to the SARS-CoV-2, where we have seen within the uh, very short time period, there are multiple variants are evolving. But 
uh, still not all the different variants has that potential to cause the havoc into our uh, life. So keeping this in mind, here we want to set up this uh, model where we will first utilize the, the, the uh, genome data to check whether this, uh, the, any re emerging or re-emerging uh, virus has the ability to cause such outbreak or even uh, has some pandemic potential to cause uh, such devastation in the coming uh, near future. And also, after uh, incorporating the clinical and epidemiological data into our system, we will finally come into a place where we can set up a time frame that when that uh, most probable time frame, when the outbreak may occur. So this is our, the entire uh, 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 planning that I have uh, put forward here into a diagrammatic uh, uh, form where first we will utilize the pathogen whole genome sequence and that will be uh, pre-trained into the through our convol convolutional neural network model which will give some outbreak cluster and from this outbreak cluster classification we, we can predict the outbreak causing potential whether an emerging or re-emerging virus uh, uh, actually is actually having the outbreak causing potential or not. And then the, the uh, data related, that is the clinical and epidemiological data related to that outbreak causing potential will be uh, retrieved and classified through the multi-layer perception model. And that will ultimately give us a probable time frame for the occurrence of the outbreak. So that is basically, in short, the uh, idea or concept that we are uh, developing at present. And the, what, are the, what could be the expected outcome from this idea if it can be materialized? So in case of any emerging or de-emerging pathogen, this proposed model will be able to predict whether this particular pathogen has any outbreak causing potential or not. And also this proposed model will, can predict the possible time of occurrence of outbreak caused by that particular pathogen. And the outcome, another important outcome of this uh, study will be the generation of effective information regarding the upcoming disease outbreak along with potential of a new viral variant, which will enable us to take the necessary precaution to prevent an outbreak. So if we know beforehand of any upcoming outbreak. So we will be prepared definitely during this last three year also we have seen, suppose if we can practice, practice before, before the, uh, the outbreak of the SARS-CoV-2, if, we, if uh, uh, we know uh, the actual usage of mask or sanitizer, et cetera, et cetera, then maybe we, we can save uh, much more lives. Uh, so, that's why this is very important. If we can know the uh, outbreak causing potential of any uh, uh, upcoming uh, 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 virus, uh, so we can prepare ourselves beforehand so that uh, much lives can be uh, 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 prevented. And also we can take necessary, much more necessary precaution to prevent an uh, outbreak like SARS-CoV-2. So that's all the uh, idea of what I have conceptualized. Thank you very much for giving me this scope to present my idea in this platform. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Uh, Surajit for uh, your presentation. And uh, we go to the next uh, presenter is Dr. Soham Chakraborty, uh, Assistant Professor at the Institute of Technology, Rurki. Uh, good afternoon to you, Dr. Soham. And, uh, could you kindly uh, share your screen? And Dr. Swajit, could you kindly close your uh, share option? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I hope I'm audible. That's right. Yes. 
Yes, you're audible. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you. So I will just uh, share my screen and yes. uh, start with the presentation. Are you able to view my slide? Right? Yes. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Okay. Right. So uh, thank you, uh, Horizon Europe uh, Partnerships, to um, uh, they give me this opportunity to present my expertise um, for this uh, uh, Horizon Europe UE India collaboration opportunity. So I present my um, expertise in the field of reinforcement learning based advanced robotics. So uh, my name is Dr. Sohum Chakravarti. I work as an assistant professor in IIT Roorkee, India, and these are my contact details. So uh, the challenge that I will uh, pose here is in the field of robotics. And as we know that uh, robotic systems are quite advanced um, these days, be they uh, like fixed robots, like with uh, only arms which are moving around, uh, or they may be mobile robots which can go from one place to another. The systems are quite complex and um, there is a lot of uh, complicated dynamics involved in these systems. So for their operation uh, to uh, so for some uh, operation that we desire from these uh, robots, uh, we need a very uh, well uh, uh, designed uh, control systems to manage these operations of the robots. Um, so what are the challenges here? Like uh, traditionally control systems are designed based on uh, mathematical models of uh, systems. However, mathematical models of these advanced robots may be highly complex, uh, nonlinear, and sometimes maybe even difficult to determine. Um, and uh, if uh, we have some model which is not very accurate, there will be uncertainties as well as uh, there may be many disturbances present in the environment which is going to affect the system. So this can degrade the overall control system's performance. So these are the challenges and uh, to uh, mitigate these challenges, the solution that uh, I propose is uh, going away from the traditional controller, shifting the gear a bit. Uh, we can propose uh, completely uh, AI based control framework, which is the model free feedback control systems where we don't need any mathematical model as such. Uh, so we are free from these uh, inaccurate models of the uh, advanced robotic systems and we can design these uh, model free feedback control systems using a reinforcement learning paradigm of the artificial intelligence uh, entire gamut. Uh, so we have this reinforcement learning framework from there. And uh, uh, also uh, we may use this reinforcement learning along with the traditional controller wherein we can have a robust design of the traditional feedback controllers by adapting their parameters using the reinforcement learning. So these are the two ideas. So as solutions, and uh, we are uh, our team is uh, currently working in these directions uh, with some initial results also. Uh, so what are the characteristics of this type of a framework that we are designed? So here the reinforcement learning is basically a learning by trial and error as uh, humans and other organisms uh, learn in their life through trial and error. So that sort of learning is uh, formalized in the reinforcement learning framework. Um, and we can have refinement of actions. So the skill of the robot will be increased over time. Um, and uh, based, and this is based on reward penalty systems similar to human learning. So whenever human a human uh, sees a defeat or uh, sees failure in certain actions, when he takes certain actions, he will probably not repeat that action in the same scenario. So that is the same sort of a thing that the reinforcement learning agent will do. Um, this is intuitive to understand how this learning is happening. So uh, when we talk about responsible uh, AI, or understandable AI, we uh, this is something that is easily understood by uh, the human operator that how this AI is functioning, uh, that is the trustworthiness of the AI. And um, we can also say this is uh, maybe uh, some sort of responsibility we can 
see here because it is uh, having lifelong lifelong learning akin to humans so as humans develop their learning abilities they become more and more responsible so this sort of behavior may also be observed in the advanced robotics which are trained by reinforcement learning a specific contribution from my own side i can make in feedback control systems design using reinforcement learning as well as adaptation of uh, uh, the traditional controllers using rl uh, and this can be in any sort of robotic systems starting from arm, arm manipulators ground robot ground mobile robots or multi rotors or any specific any generic robot configuration i am also able to develop deep reinforcement learning agent design uh, and for control generation or, or controller parameter adaptation so the design of the agent is also some something that uh, needs some uh, expertise or some understanding of the system behavior um, the core competencies from my side and the cooperations that i need from collaborators out there the competencies that i can bring in in a project are in the design of linear and non linear control systems using mathematical models Uh, and robust control system design with bounded uncertainties and disturbances, uh, DRL or and that is deep reinforcement learning based uh, feedback control systems with or without mathematical uh, models, uh, and de uh, deep reinforcement learning based adaptation of controller parameters to increase the robustness of the feedback control system, and trajectory control of robots. So these are my own area of expertise. And however, uh, when we work with advanced robotics, there are a lot of collaborations which are needed. normally from many other uh, areas of expertise which are in the areas of mechanical design of robots uh, software development for robots so if we are looking for making a robotic system as a whole then we will need all these things coming together we where my own expertise is not so much so i will need other expertise um, software development then digital tuning of robots uh, and then instrumentation in the robots and computer vision in robots my experience i have previous uh, experience in leading some projects on in reinforcement learning the first and the last one are based on reinforcement learning the second and the third are based on some design, design and development of uh, uh, robotic systems uh, these are some relevant publications on reinforcement learning very recently i have started the work uh, the keywords can be this so if any one of you having alignment to these keywords uh, we can and definitely form a team and start working together so deep reinforcement learning advanced robotics robot robots control system design feedback control mobile robots arm manipulator trajectory tracking so in in an all advanced robotic systems that's all so this is uh, my final slide thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity to present here Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Soham. And uh, we continue with the next uh, presentation, uh, which I suppose is a joint presentation. Uh, the presenters are Dr. Joshi Manisha Shivaram, uh, Dr. Uma Devi, and Dr. Soumya Ramani, uh, BMS College of Engineering and MS Ramya Medical College, uh, both based in Bangalore. Good afternoon, sir. Thank you. I'll be sharing the screen. This is Dr. Madhavi. Yep. Hello. This is this sir. This is Dr. Joshi. Hi. Good afternoon, Dr. Joshi. Good afternoon, sir. Yeah. Okay. Your Thank slides you are visible. Good afternoon. Yes. This is Dr. Saumya from Ramya Medical College. Hi. Good afternoon. Yeah. Good afternoon to everyone. Uh, myself, I'll start with the presentation. Uh, thanks to Arizona uh, European 2023 call for giving us the presentation. Uh, we three uh, members are here to present our project idea. Actually, uh, that the project idea, the title for uh, this thing is that is AI-based vision screening system to predict refractive errors in children. Myself, Dr. Madhavi, working as associate professor at the Department of Computer Science and Engineering Department, BMS College of Engineering, Bangalore, and along with my co-presenters, Dr. Joshi Manisha, who is a professor and HOD at the Department of Medical Electronics, BMS College of Engineering, and we are collaborating with uh, Dr. Soumya Ramani, associate professor, Department of Ophthalmology, MS Ramaya Medical College of Engineering, Bangalore. 
our uh, project description is like we want to develop an intelligent and efficient pediatric eye screening system for prediction and estimation of the refractive eye errors in children. Uh, that because the hypothesis is uh, ocular red reflex analysis and machine learning models are efficient tools for prediction and estimation of the refractive errors in the children. Because if the refractive errors are there, the near objects will be very clear to the children, but the far away objects will look blur actually for them. Like the main objective of our, uh, this project idea, the, uh, this thing is, uh, uh, that is we want to develop a uh, vision system actually to predict the refractive errors in the children's. Like to achieve this particular main objective, this is the below mentioned are the stages what we are looking actually. That is developing a standard protocol to control, collect and annotate the photo refractive eye images from the uh, experimental study actually. Uh, that's why we are collaborating with MS Ramaya Medical College of Engineering and developing a machine learning models to predict refractive errors and their comparative analysis and selecting the best model that gives the eye precision. That's why me, myself as a computer science department expertise I can give. And we have Dr. Joshi that is who is from the medical electronics. We are collaborating. And our third is developing an accurate red reflex identification and crescent measurement algorithms to estimate refractive errors. And finally, uh, after doing all these particular developments, we want to develop it as, make it as an, a product, which is a mobile application actually, where it can be inserted into the phone so that an opt ophthalmologist can use that one during the vision screening of the children and further follow up, which will be very handy for the ophthalmologist for screen mass screening and also further follow up with the children. Like what is the expected outcome or the output and the outcome of this proposal is under this research project, that is photo refractive eye images will be analyzed to develop the machine learning algorithms for prediction and estimation of the refractive errors because we have to estimate what is the how much of error is the refractive error is there in the children. And also using the machine learning algorithms, uh, we have to integrate into a mobile app that can be developed and used by the ophthalmologist. Like we have divided our work into three phases, where in the phase one, we are going to target the children in the age group of four to seven to collect the data. And then that is a transfer learning models like deep learning models and the image processing based algorithms can be applied or integrated to predict and estimate the refractive errors. And finally make it as a product as a mobile app, which is going to act as a screening tool. Like this is our block diagram of the proposed system because we have the idea of how we can go ahead actually. Like in the dark rooms, we can dilate the eyes of the subjects who are under the screening, that is the children, and then we can capture their uh, eye images, binocular eye images, and then we will do the image processing analysis uh, to remove any unwanted information or the noise from the images. And then using uh, existing deep learning algorithms and applying the transfer learning techniques actually uh, to predict and estimate the refractive errors. That is our main objective is to develop a vision system that is AI based vision system, which will be helpful for the ophthalmologist for screening to identify and predict the refractive errors in the children. Uh, that's all my, from my side. I now request uh, Dr. Joshi to uh, say a few words on this one further. Yeah, thanks, madam. Uh, basically, this screening system we are uh, targeting for the mass screening. Uh, generally, when students are in the school and when they are not able to uh, uh, say anything about the refractive errors or uh, any eye defects to their parents. So generally, doctors go for the screening of uh, eye screen to the uh, schools, and there, uh, instead of carrying their equipments, what is the retinoscope which they are using and which is a very costly equipment, uh, this screening system can be very handy and helpful for the uh, ophthalmologist. And with the help of uh, image processing and machine learning learning algorithms. Uh, we can also predict the amount of the uh, quantity. We can also quantify the refractive errors. 
now i would like to uh, request dr soumya ramni to uh, say few uh, words on this research proposal thank you madam uh, what is important about this research proposal is that uh, children below the age of 7 years tend to uh, get this problem called amblyopia so if they are not able to express the lack of vision uh, that they have Uh, further than that, after the age of eight, it becomes very difficult to redeem the vision despite correction of the refractive error. So this age group becomes very, very important for screening. So as uh, even um, you know, to further and make sure that vision is not all lost to amblyopia, it's very important that screening is done in this age group, and hence the importance of this proposal. Okay. Uh, thank you from our side, that is from myself, Uma Devi, Joshi, and Dr. Soumya. Thank you for allowing us for the presentation. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much uh, for your uh, presentation. And uh, we move next uh, to our sorry to our next presenter, uh, Professor uh, Kanika Bhar from the Indian Institute of Technology in Delhi. Uh, Professor Kanika. Are you here with us? Just to have to unmute your mic. Yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. Happy to Good be afternoon. here. Yeah. So um, uh, let me begin. I'll start sharing my presentation in a minute. Yes. Uh, for some reason, I can't see my screen. So, uh, uh, one second. Let me try sharing my, uh, one second. Ma'am, uh, if uh, if you're having difficulties, let me share your presentation. Hi, if you, you do that, that would be very helpful. Thank you. That would be yeah. very helpful. Okay, here we go. Okay, so here is the. You're able to see it. Yes, I am. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Please go. Yeah. So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so uh, let me just uh, uh, you know set the stage to let you know that. Uh, this uh, in this particular project proposal focuses more on responsible and the responsibility aspect of uh, AI than you know AI itself. So um, uh, so essentially we were driven by the broad agenda of AI for people, where a lot of ethical moral issues have been raised vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the use of um, artificial intelligence with human interfaces, human and social interfaces. And, uh, uh, you know, a lot of issues about uh, patient data and, uh, you know, and uh, with chat GPT, student openness and all, uh, we thought one very important stakeholder to look at in terms of the ethical use of artificial intelligence and data would be the employees. Seems like there have been issues of uh, in the popular media on, uh, uh, you know, the employee uh, privacy, uh, discrimination, stereotyping, gender-based stereotyping, and all the other things which are kind of scattered, not very scientifically studied and rigorous and put together in a framework. So with that background, we thought that we will try to focus more on the, the output of AI tools and technologies uh, while man designing people management systems in organizations, beginning with when they start engaging with people from the recruitment, selection, appraisal, development, 
then reward, administration, and employee exits. So essentially, we are going to use the ethical moral frameworks and ideologies of rights, justice, utilitarianism to see what could go wrong when we use AI tools and techniques in terms of responsibility and ethics, and how can we really control for that, either technologically or through some guidelines. So, you know, we've seen that there are, it is the use of AI for managing people is very efficient and uh, it helps in making very valid predictions about, you know, how people would behave, what kind of roles and responsibilities to give to them. And things like cyber vetting and AI based mining tools have been used for recruitment. However, they have raised, uh, you know, issues of, uh, 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 you know, the privacy, the, you know, uh, and stereotyping, uh, discrimination, and all the rest of it, which come with the, which come with the, uh, you know, with the efficiency of use of AI tools. So, of course, we've seen that, and there are different ways. So, we basically look at AI in terms of data and computation, in terms of what data is being used, and uh, how the data should be used, what data can be, you know, taken uh, up and how do we take that data and the computation to really come to identify what could be the ethical moral issues that could confront decision makers while designing human resource management systems. So for instance, you know, there in terms of data, what kind of data do you really pick up? So there are all these issues of different biases in the data. So I'll hold, I'll tell you maybe when to move, I'm just kind of giving you uh, the, the broad overview of the project. So what could be, the, uh, you know, the, the biases that could be there in the data. When you analyze the data in terms of historical, in terms of the data being biased towards one section of the people, it's not reflecting enough information or the historical biases getting into the system. These could lead to discriminatory practices at uh, different levels and recruitment, training, development, their appraisals, their movement up, and also exits in the organization. So one is that kind of, and when we use computation, what is the right data to really use? And, uh, you know, uh, whether we are respecting the employee rights, taking care of their, you know, the justice discrimination needs while using the data. So essentially we are going to look at the, we are going to apply the ethical moral principles with the responsible use of power to make sure that at every level, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the data is used responsibly, either collection, what data to collect, where to collect, how to collect, then how do we actually analyze that data? And if we get the results, how do we use the results responsibly? So by and large, that is the broad scope of uh, the research that we aim to do, which is very different. And hopefully at the end of the day, we will be able to make a contribution to uh, both, you know, uh, some, you know, technological interventions to ensure that the data and, and analysis is used responsibly, and also to, uh, you know, to make some guidelines for you. So there's some social intervention and some technological interventions based on whatever we find at the end of. So can we go to please the next slide? Uh, so this is the objective. We want to you make sure that responsibility is assessed in terms of rights, justice, non-discrimination, fairness, and utility at every level, and then identify what could possibly go wrong while we're managing people, you know, using this framework, using the AI-related, you know, decision-making tools. At the end of the day, like I said, of course, it'll be a research-based first time any comprehensive study of uh, this sort would be done. So of course we'll have a research documents, but we also want to have some practical implications in terms of developing guidelines uh, for the industry to use uh, you know, the AI tools more, more responsibly for human resource management. So could we go to the next please? Uh, so clearly, uh, it's, uh, so obviously we we'll need to assess the current, first the, the application of AI in different HR functions. It's a very, uh, you know, young and upcoming area. So first we'll have to see what is being used, where all could AI really be used, and then identify, you know, what could be the ethical issues while we are dealing with, uh, you know, use of AI at different levels. There's some, some typical issues could be what data can be taken, uh, what are privacy issues, 
Are we, you know, being, uh, are there biases creeping in our de decision making? Are we ensuring the right kind of data for making critical decisions like exits? We see a lot of, uh, you know, layoffs happening now. So what is the database? How is that being handled? Where is it that it can be handled? And I did see one of the presenters talking about uh, being simple. So one of the complex issues with AI, especially when it's applied to something like last mile like HR, is that you're not aware of the, the complex computational processes that go on. So how do we ensure that the data is simple, explainable, because it has very direct human impact in terms of you know, employability, jobs, and all the rest of it. So essentially, we are going to look at, use the ethical model principles to understand uh, you know, uh, to, to, for the use of AI in human resource management. And for the team, maybe go to the next one, please. For the team, I we have a multidisciplinary team. So we need ethicists because this is from an ethics perspective. We need ethicists, we need human resource management experts, and of course, the technology AI experts. And we have, a, you know, we don't have a consortium as, as of now, but in the current project, we are actually uh, four team members comprising these areas. But what we would look for is more people from AI and ML who could, you could give, give us deeper insights into what technologies are used for data mining for employees and how te what technological interventions could be made to correct for that. Then of course we would need business organizations from where we would need to collect the primary data. And then there are these third party agencies who have use cases of ethics like the consulting firms we, would, we could do you know, by collaborating with them. And then of course, there are the civil society organizations who will give us their perspective on what could be viewed as socially ethical or unethical at the end of the day and any other stakeholder who could be interested. The team, like I said, is uh, four of us coming from, you know, from this the, the management department at IIT Delhi and School of Artificial Intelligence, largely focusing on management because it's a last mile application uh, you know a project we have ex extensive research and consulting experience in the human resource management ethics ob and ai for business and social science domains um and of course we've worked for large or you know multi global fund funding agencies like the us air force and several ministries in the government of india public sector organizations and the rest of it so broadly that's the research idea and would look for anyone who's interested. Obviously, we don't fit into the, the core science and technology, but we thought looking at it from a social science perspective could be useful too. So that would be it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Kanika, uh, for this very interesting uh, uh, angle towards uh, the call. Uh, uh, and uh, we move on to our next presenter, uh, which, which is Dr. Gibson Varghese. Hi, uh, Gibson. Uh, He's assistant professor at St. Dominic's College at Kanjirapali, uh, India. Gibson, are you? Uh, yeah, okay, you are on, on yes. the screen now. Hi. Yeah, one second. Let me take my presentation. I hope I was on the laptop. Uh, sorry, uh, Samrat, could you please assist me in, uh, in presenting that? Can you take that GPT? I can take it, yeah, no worries. Let me just All take right. it. Uh, yeah, okay, you can start. Uh, let me just okay. Uh, okay, here we go. Thank you, thank you very much. Actually, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thanks to all. Actually, my topic is also very much similar to the previous presenter, and uh, she has made a, cl a clear um, points in, in human resource management. Uh, I myself, Dr. Gibson Vargas, I'm uh, from the Mahatma Gandhi University, Kerala, uh, um, affiliated to the Summers uh, College, Kanyarapalli. I think we uh, lost uh, Dr. Gibson now. Is that the case? Uh, 
Uh, okay, seems we lost him. So why don't we go to our next? Uh, why don't we go to our next presenter in the meantime and wait uh, for Dr. Gibson to return? It's Dr. Abra Roy Chaudhry from the Institute of Science uh, in Bangalore. Dr. Abra, are you there with us? Yeah. Please unmute your mic for us. Perfect. You have to unmute your mic, sir. Am I audible now? Yes, perfect. Could you okay, share your presentation? Yeah, sure. Thank you, uh, Dr. Samrat and uh, everybody who is present here for this presentation. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, is it visible, Dr. Samrat? Just waiting for it to pop up on the screen. Uh, no. Uh, Not yet. Okay. Would you like me to share it? No, I will do it myself. Give me a moment. Okay. okay. Okay, now it's visible. Is it? Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Just perfect. Yes, perfect. Thanks. Uh, so, uh, first of all, again, uh, thanks to all of you uh, for, uh, you know, uh, having me into this session. Uh, thanks to your access India, Dr. Samrat, and your team, um, and also the audience who are present here. So uh, the presentation uh, would talk about uh, the AI-based collaborative uh, human robot aspect of you know, uh, task planning, specifically for digital manufacturing in uh, the Industry 4.0. So uh, this is also prerogative to uh, human-robot interactions, which would definitely talk about the trustworthiness about human-machine uh, interaction. So um, I am an assistant professor at the Center for Product Design and Manufacturing at the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. And I'm also uh, a visiting professor to the Brunel University of London uh, for the same uh, task. So uh, this is the outline of today's project, or rather the project presentation that I'm uh, going to present. First, we will be talking about the title and the description, uh, going ahead with the uh, project experience that we have, and also this sort of uh, profile that we carry with us and uh, what we are looking for in our partners. And uh, then uh, maybe we'll be talking specifically about uh, some of these problems that we have solved. So uh, this is the typical uh, you know, problem statement that we are put, putting it forward from the trustworthiness of human machine intelligence or human machine interaction. So we feel that you know, uh, as we are from the area of uh, you know, smart manufacturing, so uh, I am typically looking into applications that are into this area of you know, robot-based task planning in industry 4.0. And I have uh, got some of these methods that are based on artificial intelligence and uh, responsible and robust methods, which could be called as a collaborative human robot uh, you know, task planning. And the need of these type of uh, you know, research areas are basically to enhance the human-centered uh, digital technologies in the society. Uh, I'm sorry for the typo there. Uh, objective uh, definitely is about, you know, uh, essentially increasing the trust between human operators and robots in a, you know, factory setup or maybe in an industrial setup where they work as, you know, more of a collaborator rather than master and slave, right? So that type of, uh, you know, responsibility and safety uh, has to be addressed into these type of frameworks and then have to be uh, also measured across the KPIs, which we call as productivity, safety, and trust. Uh, I also have worked on, uh, you know, thought about you know, putting the methods which we I actually generally use, which are most uh, more on the data-based modeling, activity recognition, uh, the conventional, these are the conventional task planning, navigation and controls, alongside the AI and machine learning methods that we use to, uh, you know, uh, achieve some of these, uh, uh, let's say, frameworks. Now, uh, if I talk about a recent uh, paper that we have published into this uh, field or in this relevance, is this particular paper in Frontiers in Robotics and AI, where I have, and my team, in fact, we have uh, shown how the collaborative robots actually work for a human gesture-based task planning you know, mode. And in this particular uh, algorithm, as you could see, there are various robots and perception devices that have been integrated with a human activity 
through their gestures and the audio. So this is basically a multimodal you know, sensor fusion that we are doing alongside the perception of the robot in order to do certain amount of tasks, which could be you know, human following, robot following, navigation, control, whatever it could be called as, right? And uh, we also have shown it for collaborative package handling within a given industrial setup that we have here at IIC, which is funded by the DST uh, under the Samartudyo project, right? So uh, here, you know, we have shown that type of human robot, uh, you know, interaction model framework that could be successfully implemented uh, in an industrial uh, setup. So this was, uh, this is a very recent work in 2022 that uh, we have completed. And uh, I'd just like to uh, take this forward with the new, uh, you know, uh, uh, proposal that I have given here at the Euraccess India collaboration. And some of, again, to be more relevant, I am also giving you some of these, uh, you know, projects that I'm currently doing and which is like, you know, setting up an advanced robotics and autonomous systems lab for both research and teaching at IISC. And uh, also uh, I have been a part of the ACRB core research grant uh, to develop a multimodal, you know, mobile robotic solution for outdoor inspection and surveillance in, you know, unstructured spaces. And uh, again, coming from the human machine perspective, you know, I am doing a human machine usability assessment for British Telecom for an automated utility pole inspection robot alongside Wipro uh, India. And uh, again, uh, a human robot collaboration for multi-robotic systems in the area of energy and smart manufacturing in collaboration with uh, Brunel uh, University London. Uh, so these are the, some of the aspects. And alongside it, I have been also uh, instrumental in assisting uh, Hindustan and Nautics Limited and Bharat Electronics uh, in some of the projects related to uh, the haptic control of a uh, you know, supersonic aircraft. Uh, for their cockpit design. So these are some of the relevant projects that we are uh, handling at the moment for uh, you know, developing trustworthy and responsible AI-based uh, automation tools and you know, uh, different types of devices that we are building alongside it because I'm coming from the CPDM, which is on, on to product design and development. We also build a number of products alongside the same type of you know, algorithms and models. So the competencies that we carry with ourselves is mostly into the nature-inspired robot modeling, human-robot collaboration, human-aware robot motion planning in indoor and outdoor environments, uh, multimodal, like I said, you know, sensor fusion, which would be like human activity recognition based on uh, your uh, cognitive models like brain-machine interface, uh, anything which is related to audio or maybe gesture or anything related to vision. Uh, we are also expert, uh, you know, expertise in, uh, we have expertise in AI and machine learning uh, uh, methods, which could be implemented for robots uh, in industries, in indoor and in outdoor environment. Uh, robots could be uh, collaborative robots, industrial robots, mobile robots, AGVs, drones, you name it, and we can actually implement it uh, for the solution. And the frameworks uh, that we have designed until now are, uh, you know, well accepted for social and safe HRC. This is like something that we have been doing for the last three years. More recently, uh, but I'm I'm really looking into you know designing those frameworks which can work very well for the social uh, human robot, uh, you know uh, interactions and which are also called as a safe human robot interaction. So these are two of the works. Of course, I will not go in the details because of the you know in the interest of time. But I just show that you know this was present in 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 the flagship conferences like IROS and ICRA uh, in 21 until 22. Uh, this is uh, this was uh, given in Prague, uh, where we had shown uh, the same amount of you know human model integration into uh, robot human and robot robot interaction using uh, you know deep audiovisual learning methods uh, based on you know uh, uh, reinforcement learnings. So uh, we have used a number of heterogeneous robots alongside some amount of you know multimodality that we are collecting from the humans, and then we are processing it to get some amount of application and trustworthiness in terms of you know, the entire action, reaction, or action perception feedback loop. So this was uh, about uh, the first paper. And the second paper that we have published in IROS, and again, a part of it has been published recently in ICRA in Philadelphia 2022, was about you know, measuring the cognitive load about, of a you know, collaborative robot. It's basically a, a safe human robot interaction that we are trying to show, where the human can actually detect the action and, uh, you know, of the robot and then give a feedback loop or uh, perception, uh, you know, uh, through its uh, BCI based EEG signal. So we are actually creating a BCI based feedback in order to give a task planning mode for the robot to do a safe human robot task planning and control uh, for a given application. 
So as you could see, you know, these are some of the areas that we have explored in the recent times. And then uh, the same thing has been taken forward into, because, you know, we don't want to really keep it academic, but we definitely we cater to the needs of the industry. So we also take a part of this research, uh, apart from publishing, we also take it to the industries and we have been very much instrumental to solve some of the problems that they have given us in this area of, you know, human robot interaction, human robot collaboration, trustworthiness, and, you know, responsible AI based implementation of robotics and humans together right and if i look for the cooperation typically i would be more interested in getting the domain experiences or experts of uh, you know social roboticists uh, people from human robot interaction typically uh, definitely the conventional task planning control manufacturing manufacturers of robots would be very welcome and people from social science and anthropology would also be welcome so with this, I think I will come to the end of my presentation. These are some of the references. I think I have also uh, you know, given my uh, email ID here. This is my website where you can go through. I have now also posted it in my text. So if you have any questions, any queries, any interests of the collaboration, I'd be very happy to answer all of them. Please feel free to email me. And thank you, Dr. Samrat, for you know, uh, having me here once again. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Abra, for your uh, presentation. And uh, we go back to... Uh, Dr. Gibson, uh, hopefully uh, it will work this time. Gibson, uh, are you able to share your screen or would you like me to do it? Could you please share it? Okay. Thank you. I'll just ask Dr. Abra to stop sharing his screen first. I thought I have Paul as one second. I just okay, stopped uh, sharing. I don't know why it is again showing. Okay, okay, no problem. I, I think it should work now. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Gibson, uh, you can see it, right? This goes. Yes, yes. Thank you. Sorry to everyone due to some network error. Thank you. I'm Dr. Gibson Vargis from Karma Gandhi University. And as I have mentioned, the actual context is already discussed from the earlier presenter. I'm also utilizing artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, to make a, a predictive system whereby students or any graduates can make their profile or any individual can make their profile based on artificial intelligence. And we are connecting this profile directly to the world of work, to the employers. So our project proposal is, is on making a digital twin because we are all into an, a cloud-based system and due to industry 4.0 or due to industry 5.0, Educational and training atmosphere has already changed. And all students, especially graduates right now, they are looking for a better position in jobs and they are looking for a suitable career alignment with their current studies. And due to COVID and technological disruption, we have at the same time online and offline modes of education. Anyone can learn anything from anywhere. So it is a time for us to make a digital twin, actually a skill profile of a person on an artificial intelligence platform. So this proposed project is as a next generation career guidance tool, which will have a positive impact on the labor market. As we have all experienced, the past generations have studied a lot, but at the same time, our studies were not directly connected to the labor market requirement. So we are trying our level best to make a system. And actually we have uh, piloted this work uh, uh, for the last two years, and it is already implemented in several countries of the world. And due to the combined traditional profiling with artificial intelligence, with the goal of creating a digital twin, we are going to support the employers to have the right person uh, from the right choice. Since we have our profiles digitally prepared and digitally uploaded through our system, the labor market can directly recruit the person to the uh, correct positions. And with the help of artificial intelligence, we are able to analyze soft skills and hard skills, which is on CV based or bio database. And on this basis, we can develop a digital profile. Could you please put that? Okay. So how we are combining this artificial intelligence and digital twin, a, a twin aspect of a person, of an individual. And we are developing, we have already developed a pilot system, which is based on a feedback that you see from the system. So as to get even better textual feedback related to your strengths. 
we basically give importance to the strengths and possibilities, opportunities, values, abilities of an individual, and use the artificial intelligence technology and machine learnings to predict and say that a particular profiled person is suitable for a, a job position in the market. And on the other hand, we have prepared a detailed analysis, a detailed report on the skills and requirements required by each position in the Indian labor market. So the system can then also analyze the different competencies you have and indicate whether the individual competence is mainly a competence you have studied and experienced via work. That system will be developed to create a match between the profile and the personality. Yes, next. So this is our, our system. Uh, as a presentation, I am giving you a result of the profile that we have already developed. And this profile will help us to know who we are. And we are also utilizing positive psychology reaction theories behind to predict the profile of a person. So when you give the inputs, automatically the artificial intelligence and machine learning inputs will give you a result which is uh, based on your personality type. And uh, from this uh, side, you can see a profile of the person's result uh, as we, we call a digital twin. So once we know who we are, it is very easy for us to connect our profile to the required positions. An individual can look into their detailed report and analyze what kind of capacities, values, uh, personality that he or she has and connect his profile with the right choice of a job. Next slide, please. And how we can learn from each profile. So as I have mentioned already, uh, with the help of advanced artificial intelligence and machine learning, a profile person can be detailed, uh, detailedly analyzed and analytics will predict uh, us to say that the character profile will be suitable for a position in a, uh, in a company. For example, uh, a person who is more investigative or more data analytic will have a correct job in a, in a company. So for example, they need a computer analyst or an analyst uh, from, a, from a labor market. They could say that the right person is working or is studying a course in a, such a particular college or a university. So this is our uh, prospective work where we can learn about a person and the twin profile will help that person actually link to their future job. Uh, we have already piloted this, please, next slide. Uh, this is a demonstration of, of our results, which we have piloted in India. Almost one lakh people have already done their skill profiling. And also it is piloted in six countries in Europe uh, and also in, in Malaysia and Singapore. And this is the result that we are showing, that, that we are getting. And this is a, just a demonstration of the results that we have already got. So once a candidate, A or B or has done his profiling, and our system says that this person is very suitable for a, a job in the labor market. For example, as you can see, the green shows that this is a correct a profile of person suitable for jobs in IT sector or management. This is same for the other profile of person. So you can see the examples of candidate A to a D or G or H. So different persons who have already done their profiling and our system, which is already in the twin profile system, will predict that you are suitable for that uh, job or not. So we have already piloted and we have got a very great results from the labor market, also from the uh, universities and educational and institutions. And now we have uh, confirmed, come to a conclusion so that, that we have to add more people on board. So far we are uh, from Mahatma Gandhi University and we have a, a, a private limited company from Kerala, it is CSS India. And we have a partner who is developing the software from Norway, from, it's called Epitome. And we would like to expand our consortium and we are looking for people who are interested more. And uh, with this, I'm uh, winding up my presentation and hope that we can be connected later. Thank you so much, uh, Gibson, for a very interesting uh, model you have presented, and uh, you already have shown that you have already some partners also from Europe in, and that uh, trying to form a consortium. Thank you so much. 
And uh, our next speaker uh, would be Dr. Uday Shankar, uh, but I think uh, we don't have him with us. Um, so we just uh, move on to our next speaker then, that would be Ms. Barbara Caballero Alonso from the University de Castilla-La Mancha in Spain. Uh, hi, uh, Barbara, thank you for uh, joining us. And yeah, good morning. And uh, please, uh, the share uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Can you see my screen? Can you see my screen correctly? Not, not, not yet. So just waiting for it to not start. Yet. Okay, it's coming up now. Okay. It's still uh, saying it, you have started. Uh, I think maybe a few oh. more seconds. <laughs> now it's there. It's there. Yeah. Okay, okay perfect. perfect. Thank you. Okay, so I'll try to be fast. We all have busy, busy, busy morning today. Thank you all for being here, and thank you to the organizers as well. So my name is Barbara. I work as a project manager for the Visilab group in the University of Castilla-La Mancha. Uh, we're based in the Higher Technical School of Industrial Engineering at uh, UCLM in Spain. Uh, unlike the previous um, flash presentations, I'm not going to talk about a particular project, a particular idea. I'm going to talk about what we do and what we have done in the past and to present our, our research group. So uh, we work with computer vision and artificial intelligence. We create tools with applications in um, fields such as medicine, the environment, security, space, and quality control, among others. Uh, we work with image. So all sorts of images, we'll go into be more detail in a minute, all sorts of uh, images and artificial intelligence. So some of our applications, as I mentioned before, uh, security through CCTV cameras, through any standard camera in public buildings, we can detect weapons and also uh, violence and fights. We detect the actual weapon, but through the study of body postures, we can detect violence and, and fights even under poor lighting conditions. Uh, space, uh, we have been talking about trustworthy artificial intelligence. We have created trustworthy artificial intelligence on board of satellites and space shuttles, which means that uh, if there is a problem in the satellite, for example, uh, it would take time for the information to travel from the satellite to Earth and back to the satellite. What we do is that our system on board can detect the problem, deal with it, sort it out, and that's it. And then the message will get to Earth whenever it gets to Earth, but it'll be already sorted, which is amazing for the safety of the humans on board or the actual device itself. About medicine, we work with all sort of images, uh, x-ray, ultrasound, uh, scans, PET scans, also uh, digital microscopy, digital pathology. Our system can combine them with other types of information, such as uh, statistical information, um, health, I mean, habits of uh, the patients, also gender, age, all sorts of information. Our system can combine all this information and produce diagnostics, prognostics, and, um, and also decision support systems, always with the experts in the loop. So always to assist the, uh, the clinicians, the doctors. Um, also biology and environmental applications. We have created a system, I'll explain in more detail in a minute, that can, um, monitor uh, water quality control 24 7 automatically through the study of microorganisms so far we have done this with uh, diatoms and cyanobacteria but we can work with mother other um, parasites and also uh, for psychology our face recognition system can recognize through a, like a simple camera on uh, 
a regular mobile phone. It can recognize pain, happiness, sadness, which is very useful for patients that can't express themselves due to uh, stroke, dementia, Alzheimer's, or other neurological issues. Some relevant events about uh, our team. We have led two European projects already, APATH, which was an FP7 program, and Eyes of Things, which was a H2020 program. We participated in other programs like Envision, Maestro, and Bonsais. And we have co-created the European Society of Digital and Integrative Pathology. Also the creators of the startup Ubotica here in Spain, which is a space uh, company. This is uh, APATH, Academy and Industry Collaboration for Digital Pathology. As I said before, FP7, 11 partners, and we were the coordinators. Also, Eyes of Things, so embedded vision and deep learning with uh, eight partners, and it was coordinated by us as well. We talked about uh, micro cameras that can be inserted anywhere in any sort of devices and are attached to an algorithm and an intellig uh, artificial intelligence program to detect different things. In this case, we have the picture of uh, a woman at a museum. So the headphones have a micro camera attached to the top. So when this person is visualizing the photo, the system can recognize the, the painting and it's an audio set. So the person visiting the museum can get a full description of the painter, the art, the artist and the, the work. Also, if we go, well, we can see the little doll here. She has a camera attached and it can detect happiness, sadness and pain, which is, was originally done to uh, detect pain in young children. I don't know if we can press play so you can see the video. Let me see. Oh, you are happy. I like it. Don't be sad. Let's play together. Oh. You are happy. I like it. As you can imagine, sorry, as you can imagine, it has lots of uh, different applications. Then I wanted to tell you about the Aqualities project. It's for automatic quantification and identification of uh, different species of diatoms. Again, it could be done with diatoms, cyanobacteria, and also other microorganisms which are bio indicators of uh, water quality. It can automatically monitor the quality 24 seven. Also the creation of a low cost automated digital microscopy platform for automatic identification of diatom. I can show you a picture of the microscope here, which was created for uh, below 500 euros. It'll be very, very handy for countries with low resources also uh, in remote areas where water quality monitoring, it's, it's a very difficult task. Here you can see some images of the automatic detection carried out by our microscope and how it had classified all the different species. And uh, at last, our pain detection one. This was set up as an application in a standard mobile phone. Again, this application let us uh, perceive pain in the patients, happiness, sadness for patients that are unable to communicate. So their doctors, their physicians, and also family members or carers could see <clears throat> how this patient was doing, if it was suffering, if it was in pain, if it wasn't doing quite, quite well and was unable to communicate. Sorry. These are a few websites. You can see Cordis here for APATH, that European project in digital pathology that we've led, Eyes of Things that we've led. This is our website where you can see all our publications and projects and our, my own personal email. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Barbara, for uh, outlining the different applications UCLM has and uh, the expertise you could bring into a, a consortium. Uh, we go now to our uh, last but not least, uh, the final speaker of the flash presentations, Dr. Chetan J. Shingadaiya, Associate Professor in the Department of Computer Engineering at the ARC University in Rajkot. A very good afternoon to you, uh, Dr. Chetan. The floor is yours. Sir Uday here. So my friend is also there. Last friend, Uday Shankar. Hello. Hello, sir. Yes. This Uday here, my presentation also there. So this is Dr. Uday. Sir, uh, let Dr. Chetan now uh, do the presentation and then we come back to you, Dr. Uday. Yes? Okay. Yeah, mine is last presentation. Yes. Yeah. Dr. Chetan, please uh, unmute yourself. Hope am I audible, sir? Yes. Yeah. Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, myself, Dr. Chetan. First of all, I would like to thanks uh, to Horizon Europe 2023 call that giving me an opportunity to present my idea. I am basically from Rajkot, Gujarat, uh, from RK University. Uh, my project idea is uh, we would like to develop one framework to model to measure the student performance using AI, uh, which is ideation to application approach uh, as far as uh, this model is concerned uh, our objective is to uh, uh, measure the student performance using different uh, students attribute. so most of the researchers uh, work on the academic factors rather than they are focusing on some social economic factors uh, uh, in the re their research so what is lacking in that because of this uh, uh, missing of these uh, social economic factors uh, the retention ratio and student performance is is observing that it is uh, not as much as good which it's supposed to be so and for that uh, many researchers are using some uh, uh, artificial intelligence techniques uh, which are they are having some results but which are not sufficient to, to improve the retention ratio or to improve the student uh, student academic progress, which is supposed to be here for a particular organization. So the objective is to, we are going to develop one predictive model use, uh, using uh, with AI techniques. And we are doing some clustering uh, things in our data set with the objective is to, we are adding socioeconomic factors of the students. So which is missing in each and every uh, research work right now, they are not considering that part of it. One more important thing that we are considering this research that the, the testing data uh, in which the system is going to be tested, which is very less. That means uh, from the, uh, we can say that 20 percentage or 25 percentage are data they are using for the uh, testing of the their productive model. So again, there is a question on that, that uh, how we can improve the efficiency or the performance of the students. So as I mentioned here, non-academic parameters is just to, yet to be explored. And one more important thing, the, uh, the many of the solutions are not focused on the uh, solutions or the preventing action is taken if the students have degraded performance as well as the retention ratio. So these are the major issues that we have in student performance. Our objective in this research proposal is to uh, maximize the student ratio, uh, maximize the retention ratio of the students in the institute by predicting student performance. And this research will be in the direction of finding the favorable and adverse effect uh, of social media in students' life. For, for this research, we are going to use a machine learning algorithm for feature selection, classification, and uh, some clustering algorithm. So the study will propose the combination of both techniques will perform that uh, better collected data set and attributes. So we are assuming that and we are aiming, aiming that after uh, working on this kind of uh, a proposal, we will definitely having some good results on student performance. Another very subject 
uh, in this our uh, uh, that we uh, i have identified here like we are using some classification and clustering techniques you try to collect the real data set from validate before it is tested we construct some uh, we are construct some predictive machine learning models and we try to analyze the academic and demographic and socio economic uh, uh, factors in the students academic performance you would like to check uh, the performance of the proposed model using machine learning techniques on the real data set the data the data sets which are uh, tested before the validated that means the validated and also would like to find out the socio economic uh, especially social media factors and to affect the students performance and at the end of uh, uh, our uh, predictive model the, we would like to analyze the all the results in different performance matrices the contribution of this uh, uh, this particular research proposal is to uh, we are going to uh, identify the uh, there is a problem of data quality so we try to resolve this problem and we will get the uh, we will resolve this data quality problem while applying several processing techniques and feature extractions uh, there is information uh, acquisition extractions and retrievals are difficult and the time consuming method so we would like to work on that a lack of necessary and training data on several eventualities let i am saying that while uh, many of the researchers are working on such kind of domains but the what will happen is that they are using some very limited percentage of the data to test their system so again the feature restrictions are very difficult but it is an important to implement and there are most important parameters like overfitting and underfitting in ml model which leads to a, pro, a poor predictive model so as uh, performance can be a poor so these are the problems that you would like to solve in in this our uh, research proposal so these are the contribution of my uh, uh, research idea now what are the impacts that we have in the society so the research will bring in the significant change in the field of education uh, it is timely prediction uh, would be beneficial to the educational institute to manage the result of the students we can say the improve uh, instead of manage i can say uh, we can improve the result of the students uh, this research will also contribute in decision making as well as to find out the impactful feature which will affect the student performance and at the last uh, again this research will help us to find out the favorable, favorable and diverse effect of the usage of the social media so uh, this is what uh, from my Uh, this is what my idea. Uh, again, very much thankful to Horizon Europe 2023 call. Uh, they give me an opportunity uh, to present my idea. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Chetan. Thank you so much, and we are very happy to have uh, Dr. Udaya Shankar with us, who will be then uh, truly the last presenter of uh, today's uh, uh, event. Uh, Dr. Udaya, please uh, share your screen. Thank you, sir. So, can you see this? Yes. So, hi all. Good evening, all. This is Dr. Oday, did PhD from IIC Bangalore. And I started recently started my own company called Omax Technology Solutions Private Limited. My title of talk is related to AI-enabled game theoretic mechanisms for resource allocation in 5G networks. So this is about our company. We enable intelligent autonomy in 5G and future future wireless networks while mitigating the risk of using advanced simulation techniques, automation. We provide rapid innovation also with rapid innovation. Our focus area is AI, game theory applications to telecom, visual inspection systems, and NLP. Here, I'll be focusing on this our uh, own resource allocation model, AI-enabled resource allocation model. If you see, there are this the industry 4.0 scenario where there will be emergency users will be there and non-emergency users will be there. So, where you have to provide them so resources, resources in the sense that time slot and bandwidth and power per sub-channel. This we have to provide because there are a large number of users are there, resources very less. So we'll be using auction mechanism for the time slot allocation. Afterwards, upon that, after allocating, we'll be providing the uh, game theoretic approach for the subchannel allocation, the power allocation for the each user. So this is brief. So the pro the problem of this game theory is it's uh, it takes long time for iteration solution. Once we design this Nashik, we learn the uh, Nashik solution and the auction mechanism. We'll be using this data 
for the AML, AML to using this AML, we'll be building the model. So it will directly work on that. That's what. So we provide sandbox as a service and to validate algorithms using advanced simulations. That's the first point. Our customers can describe the experiments and autonomous agents are designed using the sort game theory, AML, and declarative mechanisms. We validate agents and provide detailed results using simulation environment, which we provide our own simulation environment. Other startups, operators, universities are able to use our sandbox to validate their algorithms. For example, resource allocation, future networks. So this is the brief block diagram. And this is our unique selling point of our work. So the approach is combination of our auction theory, game theory, that improves optimal radio resource allocation. This is the first point. Then we enable rapid design and deployment. We deploy ML algorithms in corresponding digital in an environment that de-risks the real life catastrophic scenarios. So then using digital print also, this also reduces the computational load. And also this leads to the low power consumption and speed of processing. Then we are going to deploy this algorithm using the blockchain enabled algorithms. So it will provide us the highest security. So journey so far, my PhD thesis led to resource allocation from process via game theory. Of course, we are past two years, we are working with the ITU standards process and our paper accepted in ITU. And also we presented our uh, focus group standards also, my, our work is uh, uh, published. And we presented demo to national working group and FGA and also, and IPR in progress. Our competitors are proprietary solution box vendors. They were the main uh, uh, competitors, but the problem is there. It has a intensive manual effort verification and uh, de development de design is there. So, but in our case, we are providing the rapid design deployment capabilities using the our own mechanism where it's automation, complete automation will be used in here. And also, this current solution does not offer flexibility in terms of the meeting the uh, quality of service requirements. We are including that also in our work. And uh, this is our technical capability, which is there. We are working with this uh, in line with the ITU standard and partnership under ITU for uh, open source RIC software. Simulation scenarios and open data will be sourced from the ITU, AI for good. And simulation software to be sourced from the open source, simu 5G, or third party collaborators can also be used our system. Then uh, other one, this is our budget thing, which we are providing. So here also we give our uh, unique uh, selling points for the reference. This is what our milestone. So from uh, second year, third quarter onwards, validation demo will start continuously. So then reports and road shows, everything will come here. So this is what our model is the B2B model, which is provide a sandbox as a service. So this is known as the OMAX AI enabled sandbox, the name itself, to validate algorithms using the advanced simulation. So our customers can do the same thing what, what I said. So we need financial support, IP sharing is possible, and travel demo support is needed, that's what. So this is our open strategy. First, we start with the open data and open simulators, then implement controllers as per the ITU specs. Of course, we collaborate to add more simulators in the scaling strategy. And originally, we developed XAP controllers and uh, extensions algorithms, that's what. Thank you. Thank you for giving opportunity, sir. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Uday, uh, uh, you know, showing the, the, the technology which you are uh, working with. And yes, uh, with yes. that, I would like to thank all the presenters and of course, all the participants for uh, being here. And uh, I would say this has been a very uh, interesting session with such a variety of uh, topics which have been presented. And it, it shows how actually uh, uh, how deeply artificial intelligence is entering our day-to-day -day life and what responsibility also comes with that. Isn't it, Tanya? Uh, it gives me a great pleasure to uh, welcome Tanya Friedrichs, our uh, policy officer at the uh, European Commission in Brussels, uh, a very important figure in the EU-India collaboration in research innovation. And many of you know Tanya from her time here in India, and we're very happy that she's here to give also the closing remarks of uh, today's event. Tanya, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Samrat, for this introduction. Uh, am I audible? Can yes. you hear me? Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, you, you said already what I was going to say, a very rich session. Of, and I would 
um, in the first place, I'd like to thank you and the delegation um, in of the EU in New Delhi to having organized that. It's really a privilege that um, for the scientific community of Europe and uh, India that you get that chance on a specific call to get so close, a closer understanding on the call itself. Um, and as you said, uh, such a rich contributions, uh, you know me a little bit, you know, it scared me a little bit, like all this digitalization and this virtual world and uh, all this creativity that India has on artificial intelligence. So uh, rich, good that that session was organized, very rich um, inputs and um, over to the scientists and the innovators from Europe and India to further connect and uh, prepare good proposals. In that context, let me repeat what I always say is please also keep reading and read very carefully the call text and uh, because we are all, you're all enthusiastic scientists with an idea, you've been working on something and it may not fully match what we are call of proposal calling upon. And so make sure that you are really um, with your partners in one consortium, um, looking at a contribution to increasing the uh, scientific excellence and finding solutions to the problems that we call upon in, um, in, in this specific call. But uh, we're very happy also, let me also say that, that uh, the um, Department of Science and Technology has selected that specific call to facilitate participation of Indian uh, participants to offering co-funding, also read very carefully, therefore, the modalities that apply to that co-funding, the specific conditions that have been set by these, these DST in terms of who can participate and not. But of course, I trust that uh, my dear colleague Vivek Dam has explained this very well. But again, being a lawyer myself, the um, it's the detail is always what matters, and therefore you have to again read very carefully also the website notice. Um, thank you very much for organizing that. Thank you for already this enthusiastic contributions. We can only hope, as also uh, my colleague uh, Benoit Sovroche, who opened this session, said that we are looking forward to really rich contributions. Uh, but we trust from what we have seen today that uh, everything is there to make it happen. So best of luck. Thank you for organizing it. And thank you already for all these uh, demonstrations of your knowledge on a topic that we really need to improve, and that is using artificial intelligence in a responsible way. Maybe then I will be less afraid of this virtual world uh, coming uh, to us when it is done in a more responsible way. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tanya. And before I let you all go, please uh, give us a, a, a big smile into your cameras. We'll take uh, uh, some screenshots of today's event. Perfect. Thank you so much to all the presenters again. Uh, thank you to Tanya and Benoit for the op opening and closing this event. I think it was a very rich afternoon. And now, of course, as Tanya always says, the ball is in your courtyard now. To our dear scientists, you know, uh, we wish you all the best. Hopefully, you will uh, be able to form a uh, and an enriching consortium and apply for, for this uh, very important call. Thank you so much and have a wonderful afternoon and a, a good lunchtime in, in Europe. Thank Bye. you. Uh, Samrat, as a small request, if you can share this snap with all of us. Yes, of course. I was going yes. to say, where is Vivek? Thank you, thank you. Nice yeah. to see you all. Bye. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you.